But yeah, that was a that was a cool tour. I, I was, that was a, a lot of fun. The second one we've done with them, obviously. But. Yeah, it was a good run. I uh, thankfully the only other show I got to see after that was the Kill Switch tour. I did some interviews, and then okay. literally the next day, because uh, when talking to uh, Justin from Kill Switch and jb from august burns red you know it was wild because we did those interviews about an hour apart like so around like 2 p.m my time um and it was wild because we did the one with jb and it was like yeah we're here in rumblings like see it was at the time where it was like portland show might be half calf now yep, yeah. because of whatever we're still figuring shit out the rest of the tour seemingly is going to be fine mm -hmm. and then by the time i did the interview an hour later with justin it's like seattle's canceled uh these other dates are probably going to have to be moved to other rooms but it looks like half the tour is going to get shut down. So then literally the very next day, everything was done. Whole tour was shut down. Yeah. And it was like, we Jesus, got lucky. What man. A 24 we hours. Hours. Yeah. yeah. We, we were so fortunate. Not only did we miss the shutdown by a week, we were able to finish the whole tour, but it got to the point where, uh, we were at the end of our record cycle on that one. I mean, we didn't, we had maybe one more tour. We could have squeezed out of it kind of thing, but it was time to start going back for new music. And, uh, so we, 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 the, at least the album got to have its full, you know, go at it, which was yeah. nice. Yeah, it's been kind of funny talking to some people about how stoked they are. Like, you know, the Nothing More camp, like Mark's a good friend and, you know, they're recording mm -hmm. right now. And he's just very much been like, yeah, this didn't really affect us necessarily because we already planned this time to be off. Uh, you know, our touring cycle was done. That ghost tour we did, you know, that we hung out at was honestly kind of the extra like like squeezing the last little tour we could out yeah, of our album sure. run, but it was just too good of a tour to pass up uh too good of an opportunity to you know get into some uh you know arenas and so forth and tour with ghost and get in front of some new fans so it's like all right like why not and mm -hmm. but it's it's been really crazy just to see you know having friends and you know like dudes in the acacia strain it's like that's a smaller band they put out basically two records there's some stuff that I've been privy to that they were planning on doing to tour in support of the new release and, and uh, sure. celebrating an anniversary of a record and all of that shot to shit. And now it's like, we just had like one of the greatest records, you know, charting and all that kind of stuff that we've had in a while. And now we can't do anything. Mm -hmm. And it's like, Absolutely. you just wonder like, what does, what will that do to a band of that size that relies so heavily on actually being on the road? That That's hard too, because, um, this, uh, summer that we just finished you know was going to be uh i just think uh it was already slated to be as far as ticket sales went probably one of the highest grossing rock years that we've had in a long time i mean there were some huge you know um you know my it was a good year oh my gosh it was going to be some great tours a lot I mean, of it was very saturated tour was huge too yeah uh just great 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 packages um and have built it, you know, on the amphitheater front, the, some of those, uh, you know, disturbed, uh, corn, not best, that was, yeah. uh, that was, we had our package, five finger had theirs, uh, had been building these kind of opportunities with those larger venues and selling more and more tickets each year for the past four or five years. Or so, and, uh, this was kind of slated to be that year where we really, you know, tool a bunch of cool stuff and, uh, I hope that it didn't really, I hope we just put a pin in it and really didn't, you know, pull back. But uh, one of the tough things is going back out, in, you know, that's where we hope to resume is where that tour had left off. And the problem is, is every artist in the world is going to be competing for those, not only those venues, but I mean, try to get production right now. You know, we usually do ours um, from trucks to buses to PA to lights. We'll do kind of like a, somewhat of a two year lease at a time. Mm -hmm. Um, but obviously everybody's had to fold on those and uh, we'll see what's available when everybody goes back. It's tough. So it's, uh, I think it's that's kind of the interesting thing about where this is now um, and kind of leading into actually a more of a formal uh, introduction. And is it Rausch? Is that how you say it? Uh, Rao actually rhymes with Rao. Rao. It's okay. German. Yeah. Okay. I just learned how to spell or pronounce it last year. So don't feel bad. Dude, you know, what's funny is, uh, Mark actually speaking of him, uh, when mm -hmm. I was trying to say his name, he was like, actually it's Vole Lunga. Um, and then he was like, I just found out through like a 23 me that someone in my family did that we have been saying it wrong. Like my dad's whole life, my whole life. Like we just <laughs> found out that we came from a different area than we thought and like all this stuff. And it's, it's kind of interesting to hear that that's actually happening a little bit more now due to, yeah, some of these things where you're just like, Oh, I apparently half my life has been a lie. <laughs> I, I love it. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to go down that road. I haven't done one of those yet, but I'd like to. Does it not freak you out? The, the fact that you're giving up DNA? 
Uh, I'm sure I'm on so many watch lists already. They already. Know I mean, I was going to say you between know. you know this basically. Oh, the we're being monitored in so many things, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I had mentioned before we started. You know, I had COVID, so I, I, I they've got me there. I'm at, who, I Dude, that know. test sucks. It's it horrible. Was, it was so it gnarly, is awful. Yeah, my kids had to to have it done. Um, Ooh. And it, I, I was just not. How how old are your kids, by the way? If you don't mind me asking. Uh, 10, 12, and three. Okay, so old enough ish to kind of at least be explained what's about to happen. Oh yeah, and, okay. and uh, my two older ones in particular were like, uh, uh-uh, I don't want to do it. You know, Ooh. it was it was horrible. And I think they have different ones now. They'll have uh, quicker tests that they can swab your cheek, back your throat, kind of thing. Oh really? Yeah, I know. Oh. Like the Rogan Camp and those guys, those are the tests that they're doing. They're not going back to the brain too much anymore. But uh, yeah, that, yeah, that, oh, that was being assaulted. <laughs> It was terrible. Well, the worst part is, is at least ours, when I had to do mine, I had to drive away afterward, and, and you're, like, trying to put your Same. mask back on, and then you're, like, tears, you're watering up, oh. and then you're, like, doing this. It's, like, the only way I could describe it was, like, just imagine, like, jumping into water, getting a bunch of water shot up your nose, yeah. and then, like, you're just, like, all your senses are kind of in disarray, and then, oh, it's like, you're terrible. trying to drive as soon as you're done. You're, like, I can't even pull away anywhere and just let this happen. <laughs> Yeah, I went to one of the drive through places and uh, Same, like, yeah. okay, go ahead and pull forward. And I'm like, I can't, hope I don't hit anything. <laughs> yeah. This is insane. Um, yeah. But you're actually here to talk about the new Love and Death record, which unfortunately for everyone who will hear this, won't be out until next year, uh, Valentine's Day weekend, uh, February mm -hmm. 12th. And, uh, you know, perfectly preserved is the record. You dropped the video today for Drown as of when we're talking. Uh, I got the record earlier this morning. And I got to say, um, you know, having gone through it four or five times now, it's wild to kind of hear how this feels like a whole new band compared to where it started from between here and Lost, you know, what, seven years ago, I think at this point? Yeah. Or eight. Yeah. Um, you know, was that kind of a thing that you and Brian sat down or maybe collectively as a band sat down and really wanted to make this not sound like corn? You know, because unfortunately, mm -hmm. that's what I think a lot of us kind of took away with Brian having just left corn, you're like, Oh, here's the corn sound that we haven't heard in a yep. little bit, but this record yeah. doesn't sound like the first record. I feel like it sounds mm -hmm. like a brand new band. How much of that was an actual thought out plan to really kind of approach us as a new entity. I think there was some foresight there, but uh, you know, to, to go back on the, on the first uh, record, as you had mentioned, when we were writing and recording and finishing that he had, at that time, not going back to corn yet. He was still out. And uh, the, initially, when I started working with Brian, it was 2010, 2009, possibly. So, um, it was in a very different headspace, you know, kind of trying to remove himself from the, like, I don't want to do the core. I, I want to write without playing guitar. I want to do those kinds of things. So we ultimately kind of got the, trusted each other enough to, where he, he let me be just like, well, why don't you just write some riffs? Because that's what you do. You know, um, and of course, what what he came up with is you go, OK, there's the sound that that's what it is. And at the time, this was um, coming out of the kind of dubstep album that Korn did. So that was where Korn was at um, his his first album back with Korn, I think Path of Totality, I think, or maybe it was after that. Uh, started introducing more of the guitars and more of a band driven thing, even the um, making of the record was very different. Mm -hmm. But uh, where we were at that time, what he was doing was not necessarily being accomplished with the sound, what, what Korn was doing. Um, so coming out of that, and then as the record was releasing, that's when he announced he was going back. So, I mean, it was, it was right on top of each other. Um, so going into this one, there was kind of a conscious effort to um, acknowledge the fact that Korn is still, and has pulled away from the electronic, elements relying on it that much anyway right and uh going back to more riff based stuff especially you know head monkey just those dudes feed off each other it's amazing being in a room with them watching them just like okay wait put it again uh, okay what if we uh, you do that and i'll do this they just do their thing and they it's a call and response it's a really cool process to to, to see happen um and so for this uh both of us were able to we've mentioned in the past um take risks that we couldn't necessarily do with our other bands and um, use that as an opportunity, you know, use that as kind of some sort of currency to go into this and create not a new sound. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel because we want to make the fan base, the collective fan bases that we do have happy. And it's something that they would want to listen to and want to hear. And we're not coming out with this crazy experimental thing, but at the same time, um, take some risks and try some new things that we wouldn't 
trying our own band. So um, I, I think that was a conscious decision, but uh, it, it felt pretty organic. I mean, we, we recorded 20, 25 songs for this one. Uh, and most of them up until finishing were about 60 to 75% done. You know, these kind of ideas that like, you know, do we want to keep these when we revive them? And then once COVID hit, that's where we really kind of hit the, the ground running. Okay, all right, let's sit down. And um, the, the, the good thing about COVID, um, there's, well, not COVID in particular, but this time off <laughs> is just the fact that it, it's kind of this big equalizer. Uh, for better or worse, you know, um, if you're going to release music right now in the rock genre, we rely on getting in front of people, uh, you know, press is an outlet. Well, thankfully, you guys are essential, you know, but uh, same with radio. Uh, that's going to keep moving. But uh, the connections that we have from the live experience just isn't there. And that's what we rely on for a lot of our um, getting in front of people, and letting people know and promoting from that side of things. So not having that, it's been a good equalizer because newer bands or bands that aren't as big, um, unless there's not the same accessibility with, with like I was mentioned, mentioning press, but uh, we're all kind of in the same, same place right now, you know? And so I, I really hope that that can be a takeaway that the good stuff is going to rise to the top. Because I think, um, unfortunately, there's a lot of stuff out there that gets pressed um, when things are, uh, back to normal, I guess that that maybe shouldn't. <laughs> maybe they get pressed because they've been around for a long time, or they get pressed because there's a lot of money behind it, or something like that. It, it gets in. Fr there's a lot of people paying attention to it, and it's not necessarily the greatest stuff, you know. Um, and then you have. It's hard to create um, another awareness of bands like we did with Nirvana or with Corn. You know, both those bands uh, w when they were signed it was such a different time, a different generation with the record recording industry, but it's like, uh, well, we'll sign this. I mean, maybe it'll do good. We'll see what happens. And then it just takes off. Um, it's difficult to have that kind of thing right now because, uh, there's such a priority and things There's such a, and there's so much saturation of music out there to have anything stick. It's pretty tough. Well, I think with <clears throat> kind of, you know, a handful of things that you kind of touched on there, um, Coincidentally, I watched a quick little like 20 minute thing yesterday on YouTube of Brian kind of chronologically going through the songwriting of Korn. Mm -hmm. And, you know, his big takeaway was, you know, we're very influenced by Mr. Bungle just doing weird shit that like doesn't seem like it would work Crazy. or very weird chords, uh, especially being on a seven string lower registers, all that kind of stuff and lower tuning. And, you know, he's kind of going through like, oh, well, Monkey came up with this this thing. And then I played this weird little riff over it. Like, you know, the intro to Blind. That first riff, that da -na -na -na, like that's a weird, mm -hmm. like wouldn't really be anything that someone would probably use to be the beginning of a, an album, let alone a song. And then, you know, he's just kind of working through like, oh, here's how we did like Adidas or Twist. Like these kind of, you hear it. And when you hear it in conjunction to the full band, you're like, oh, that mm -hmm. sounds great. But when you start narrowing it down, like here's the riff here's the groove we were kind of looking for. And then, and then Jonathan came over and it's like, if we were doing something that's, you know, a major, he's doing something totally minor over it or mm -hmm. all these kind of things. And it was really interesting to watch him break down corn musically mm -hmm. in a way that I've not really ever heard articulated. And it was, to me, it was really interesting because it really does make you kind of, especially when you have good headphones or you really start paying attention yep. to the production of things where you just kind of start going, yeah, man, fuck. Like when he's talking about Got the Life and he's like, Yeah, we're playing this weird thing. It's got a disco beat. And then here comes John yeah. with a very aggressive vocal over it that almost creates a, a sort of counter rhythm or a heavier rhythm than what we're already putting down. And you just kind of start thinking about it. And you're like, Yeah, who the fuck would do that? Like that makes no yeah. sense. And there's even stuff on Love and Death Records, kind of some oddball things. Like to me, you know, I was wondering how much of the guitar parts are actually Brian writing because given the capacity of what I know him to play and how he plays, this doesn't sound necessarily like Brian doesn't mm -hmm. even sound like it's in the same tuning as Brian plays. Like I think mm -hmm. Ed and uh, monkey usually are in a, I think um, on the yep, seven yep. string. And this sounds, if I had to guess, since I just got a seven string recently, this might even be in like G G sharp. Yeah. So this is G okay. sharp drop tuning and they're in a standard. So okay. it, it is a very different thing. Um, so the sonics from that point can be different. Um, you're saying, you, as you're talking more about it not sounding like Brian, and um, there's nuances and things that he does sonically that are very signature that that him and Monkey both do. You know, um, 
and it, it's too it's difficult to not kind of fall into that trap of like, well, we should probably do this, me, 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 like this weird dissonant thing right. on top of it, because then we'll know here, or put this swirly Leslie thing, chorus, super chorus thing on it, um, you know, kind of the go-to effects for that sound, or it's hard to not like keep painting with the same brushes. So I think that, that we did kind of put some different um, pressure on ourselves from, from that perspective to not kind of fall into the same um things and do something different um where as for me too uh with breaking benjamin riffs like i know that we're obviously pretty well and uh to try and do something that i wouldn't necessarily do there my, my go-to's and not that it's not lazy writing it's just you you speak oh. a certain language for so long it's it's difficult to kind of to pull yourself and i think that's where the ch us challenging each other back and forth uh really helped well i think that's something that is very obvious on this record and was kind of surprising because you know for me like i just said i, I kind of broke down corn has their sound there's sort of a thing especially with two guitar players that they do that's mm -hmm. you know it's almost at times they're not necessarily playing a proper rhythm and lead it's kind of trading oh. off and letting fieldy at times come in and, and play a lead or you know playing a counter melody or whatever it's just kind of really interesting how that that band works and then even in breaking benjamin it's like you guys have your sound there's kind of what i know you guys to do and at times even being a three guitar band um uh -huh. And so it, it's one of those things where, you know, sometimes like you look at that first Stone Sour record and it was like, yeah, this feels like people in Slipknot not doing like these weren't quite up to par to be in yep. Slipknot. Or you look at, you know, a, a really a better one because there was nothing really before it like that. But like you look at uh, Merde Noms by Perfect Circle. Mm -hmm. That didn't sound like Tool in any way, shape or form. No. But the thing kind of becomes um, there are pieces that you find where you're like, oh, okay, I kind of hear this person's influence coming in until mm -hmm. they've had a record or two under their belt and touring to kind of figure yeah. things out. And this record didn't really feel like that where I'm like, ah, there's kind of the Breaking Benjamin influence. There's a little bit yeah. of the corn influence. It just feels like the weird thing to me, honestly, the only person in the band that I feel like I'm like, oh, this fits this person. What I know them to do is Isaiah because of what yeah. he does in Phineas. It sounds... Mm -hmm. Isaiah is the only one where I'm like, I get this. The rest of you, I'm like, well, it's <laughs> hard for that. you to kind of get your heads around this because it's more of kind of a, a genty kind of vibe, a new, more mm -hmm. modern style of guitar playing and, and the way that, you know, kind of more staccato y kind of riffs and so forth. So, yeah. And yeah, that's Isaiah brought a lot to the table there. I mean, he has a sound and he's a player, man. Uh, that guy, I, we're all super stoked to just. He's a lot of fun to record. He's a lot of fun to work with. How did how yeah. did you guys how did he come on your radar? Because he's as far as I know not toured with you or uh, breaking like breaking bed. No, or so I uh, we had crossed paths just through. I, we both live in Nashville. Hmm. Uh, well, you know Brian lives here too. All three of us, I guess, and um, it kind of crossed paths in different like friends of friends kind of thing there. Um, and uh, we were out on tour and we went and saw uh some other friends of ours here live in nashville uh cody the guitar player for wage war mm -hmm. great and i love that band yeah yeah great guy uh we write a lot together too on other stuff and we so he we were all in new york city at the same time we had a day off so i went out and saw them and uh isaiah was filling in for uh from like Moss to flames mm -hmm. and uh so we saw him and they were opening up and uh, my tour manager and I were sitting on the side stage like, holy shit, look at this kid. Like, he was just, he was rocking it. And, you know, since they were opening, they weren't on a riser. He was just set up on his floor with a little kit, just killing it, you know. And uh, when afterwards, and he came up to me. He was like, hey, dude, I'm Isaiah. I'm like, no way. Okay, now I'm putting all the pieces together. And it was the first time we kind of crossed paths in a formal place. And then, um, yeah, kind of just came time to, um, when we, we recorded, Johns with Dan Johnson, the the old drummer, on uh, about ten other songs, and then we rewrote a bunch and wrote some new songs. And obviously, these are the that's that batch is mostly what ended up on uh, the new album. Uh, but uh, we had talked about working with with just different sound, different player kind of thing. Um, and Isaiah's name came up, and uh, so yeah, gave him a call. We got connected with him and was stoked. I mean, he 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 hustles and he he has some cool parts. Again, in, in ways that we wouldn't necessarily think because, um, you know, Brian and I, both of our, our riff backgrounds are kind of more on the, the, the bounce of the riff. And um, sometimes that can be accomplished with four on the floor, you know. Mm -hmm. So our minds don't necessarily go to that 
Um, Off time signature stuff. Yes, uh, writing over the bar line and, and those kinds of things. Um, so that those that was a cool addition and, and something very welcome for sure. Yeah, it was just one of those that like once I saw him post starting to post teasers and stuff like that because i know i had seen him on that like mods tour uh i had interviewed mm-hmm. the full phineas camp uh when they were on a headline run a while ago okay and so it was like one of those for me like where i kind of saw him teasing this project and i'm like what the what the fuck is this and then when mm-hmm. he like did the promo photo i was like holy shit and then it was just like okay i i kind of get you know the rest of it because brian had, in, in our chat that we had done was like yeah you know i kind of want to resurrect life and death or love and death um thinking of probably oh. having Lacey, he keeps calling her Lacey Flyleaf, which was funny. Um, yeah. and he, you know, obviously someone, uh, you and he's like, maybe even Ben, I don't know. Um, but you know, there's a handful of people, but Isaiah was never in that, mm-hmm. in that conversation. So it was just like, when it came about, it's like, I don't know how, I'm sure there's a cool story there, but it's just not what I would expect for yeah. in the realm of who you guys know as drummers. It's like, you could, you know, potentially have gone to someone like a Roy Mayorga who, mm-hmm does a great job of playing all different kinds of styles yeah, or he's a beast or yep. you know a handful of other people and that wouldn't have been shocking either uh, no absolutely and that would have been a great fit i think i mean he's a great guy or he's a great guy but like uh yeah isaiah brought something uh, again he his his background is much more technical and much more um it's kind of really laid back uh, and group oriented yeah yeah so he it, it just it worked i, mean, I think those that it was a cool piece of the puzzle to pull in together. Um, obviously we were fans of, uh, you know, heavier music in general, you know, you know, so, uh, I'm always listening to that stuff and always absorbing as much as I can from just, uh, you know, some, sometimes the stuff like whether it be periphery or, or whatever, or these polyrhythms and things, sometimes I can get over, uh, my head. I was in music <laughs> the like, half a semester I spent in college was like a jazz studies major. And so mm. like familiar with it and I can read music, and everything, but, uh, it gets over my head and I, I'm such a song guy that I, I find myself, I can't go too far down that lane, but, uh, and I feel like there is kind of a theme sometimes. I, uh, the, uh, well, the Arch- new architects album is a great example. Like those dudes are masters at what they do and they, they've found themselves kind of pulling back essentially from that, and just crushing it. And now they're in a position where they're showing everybody else. Like, I, I think that album's going to be really big. I know a lot of people that worked on that album and uh, they speak pretty highly about it. I think there's going to be some, that thing's going to make some waves for sure. I think the thing that's interesting about kind of heavy music as a whole right now is, mm-hmm. you know, unfortunately you, you look at, and I was actually listening to a podcast. I just found randomly. It was suggested because now that Apple or iTunes or however, whatever the fuck you want to call it mm-hmm. has basically revamped its interface. So instead of, you know, podcasts just being straight up, like whatever I'm listening to, now, when I'm listening to something, instead of just the shows or whatever, it'll give me the episodes that have dropped in chronological order. If I want to go to that show, I got to kind of click on it and go. But then now it's mm-hmm. popping up new shows that because you've been listening to this, here's an episode of this other podcast you may not you may like, not just straight up. Here's a podcast you may like. It's a here's an episode. So I was Absolutely. listening to one from I think the dudes from could be wrong. I think he said MXPX. Um, mm-hmm. But basically, it's uh, Dan. Dan Dave McCosty's or I don't know, something like that. Didn't really see what the guy's name is, but he breaks down a song. So like hmm. the episode I listened to is with AJ and uh AJ and Jeremy uh from Lit talking about yeah. writing uh my own worst enemy. And you know, like they're talking about like, oh, it's weird, like there's no pre chorus, there's no bridge, there's no like you don't really like he's and he's breaking it all down and as he's kind of saying this i'm like holy shit you're fucking right there is no there Mm -hmm. is no like it's such an untraditional song structure and i never really thought Mm -hmm. about it and you know as you're kind of listening to things like that and it's it's those are kind of the things i like listening to and learning about because i listen to a lot of music and and start noticing nuance and production things and so forth but in in that something that you know i was thinking of today actually is you know they talked about like oh back when that song became big you know it was a lot of down tune riffs and i'm not really into that i'm more of the standard you know guitar tuning writes and riffs da 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 and i kind of was thinking about how that's sort of the mentality of you know back in the you know the quote unquote new metal days is everyone was like oh it's just dumbed down riffing like it's not that hard Mm -hmm. you know that or the other and i feel like at least now heavier music is kind of being tagged as being actually proficient you look at a band like periphery or you look at a band like mashuga and stuff like that and you no longer can just say well that's just noise it's like yeah, oh, yeah. okay you play the fucking kick drum pattern oh too. yeah good you know, luck. look at what lamb was doing and stuff like that it's like you know chris adler 
was the stuff he was doing with you know the splashes and stuff. He wasn't using his high or he wasn't using the, the kit in a traditional way anymore. Instead of where someone maybe kind of doing a beat where it's kick, you know, snare, hi hat. Now he's mm-hmm. doing it on mostly cymbals and toms and barely using yep. the snare. And the snare might actually be replacing a kick pattern that most people would be doing. And when you kind of start doing that, it's almost like, yeah, metal was never dumbed down or anything like that. Like even if you go back to the 80s stuff, it's like it became so over the top because people were so fucking good at their instruments. Yeah, that it became a joke, and it's like now you're kind of, yeah. you know, a lot of people are joking about gent, but it's like, yeah, okay, yeah, it might be just zeros and ones like a binary code, but it's like there is a lot of technical aspects to even doing that of having to stay in a time and making sure the time structure stays and works and oh, yeah. works against the counter time and all this kind of stuff, and it's like you can no longer say heavy music is dumbed down. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, and I, I love how music evolves. Um, you look at it like, like in the air tonight. Like, hmm. You know, there's not a single symbol in the whole song. No, you know, nothing. You know, and sometimes when you start to pull back from things and doing it in a non-traditional way, it really makes a statement. And in that song, it makes the, the toms and the snare that much more important. You know, um, and that's, I, that's, I, oh, what's not being played is exactly. And I think bigger. a lot of times you'll make something heavy by having something softer in front of it. Or are you vice versa? Um, and I think there was that, like when metalcore and everything started happening, the, it became more accessible because, like as they lay dying, mm. you would have something that maybe somebody doesn't isn't super into thrash, but they'll have this thrash thing and it opens up to a melodic chorus. And it's like, okay, well, yeah, I, c- I can relate to that. Or the, the riffs became more bouncy; they became a little bit more new metal inspired. And it's like, okay, I can relate to that. And that was the gateway drug into a lot heavier music that people would necessarily listen to. And then, um, you know, like a lot of the bands that I looked up to with their sounds and just their out of the box, Norma Jean back in the day, um, Dillinger, just some of these bands that were doing some different stuff that commercially weren't as, it wasn't as accessible to a lot of people. Like if everybody has the palate for that kind of thing, but corners the same <laughs> with Mr. Bungle, right? I mean, you had, uh, Faith No More, a song Epic, which is amazing, c- come out. But uh, from the same mouth and the same brain comes Mr. Bungle, and you listen to some of that shit. People are like, I mean, look at California. I don't know, like, man. That record is fucking insane. Like, yeah. you got like lounge tracks. <laughs> oh, it's crazy. Yeah, it, so, it's I mean, a lot to digest. And some people love it, man. They're, they're always going to have a cult following. But uh, being able to make that accessible and, and be able to communicate like raw motion and be able to communicate a song and that somebody has something that they walk away with. That to me was what was the exciting part about music, regardless of genre. Cause I, I listen to all kinds of stuff. I still yeah. obviously have a soft spot for heavy music, but um, that's what I like about it. That's what I love about working with Ben and breaking Benjamin. Like the dude's just a master at melody. I mean, he could sing about a shoe and there's just something about his voice sometimes, which he does by the way on demos, like just makes up words and you're like, damn it. That's so good. You know, I don't even know what you're saying yet, but you're, you're scatting this melody and you're selling it. Yeah. Like I'm into it. I know what we're going for here. And, uh, it's just a strength of his. And you got other guys, uh, you know, Trent Rezzer is a huge influence of mine. Same sort of thing. Like he just has a way, he doesn't have the best voice. He doesn't have the best pitch. He doesn't, he's not the best technical, technical singer. Uh, but just the way he communicates, you know, just, it's brilliant. He's so far ahead in a lot of things and always has been. I think something, and I might cut this out just cause I don't want to ruin the surprise, I guess. Cause it seems like you guys have been trying to keep it under wraps. Um, which actually, I should look that up right now actually and see, cause technically if you, if your, uh, pre-orders went live in the last couple of days, then in theory, a- Apple sure. music would have, uh, yeah, let me look it up. Ruined your surprise because it would be shown, but you'd not be able to be heard. Uh, yes, I, I know exactly what you're saying. Uh, yeah, actually, it is. It's it's show. Someone doesn't know that that's okay. So I can talk about this. I'm not going to feel bad. Um, yeah, because I was going to cut it out, but then I was like, wait a minute. If you have pre-orders up, then people, in theory, because you have talked about the cover, people mm-hmm. who see on it. So I, I'm not really ruining anything at this point, unless you want me to cut it out. But uh, no, you're good. Your, your cover right. of uh, yeah, your cover of uh, "Let Me Love You," which is a DJ Snake Justin Bieber collab. Yeah, how? <sighs> How did you land on that song? Because as someone who, like, I'm unabashedly into a lot of uh, pop and hip hop and stuff like Mm -hmm. that. And so to me, I love a good cover. And last night, my my co-host and I 
we're talking about random covers because that Mopop thing of Alice in Chains just dropped, mm-hmm. where yep. basically everyone was doing Alice in Chains covers. And, you know, I was like, oh, it was crazy. I think Fishbone had my favorite cover, and it was the most yeah. surprising one because that's not what I would have expected from them. Sure. Yeah, I just um, watched that last night as well. So to me, it's one of those where, um, you know, I love a good cover that presumably wouldn't you wouldn't expect from who you're hearing it from. So how did you guys land on kind of a pop hit like that? I know listening to the interview you guys did for Loudwire a couple of days ago, uh, the story seemed to be that Brian and Lacey kind of were talking about doing something. He had talked mm-hmm. about that cover, but not really in a sense of how he even came about it. And then Lacey's like, Oh yeah. my God, I love that song. I've been listening to it. So was it really just that? It was like, crazy. Was- yeah. So it initially happened. I mean, the stars aligned there. Um, so JR, Abara is the other guitar player in love mm-hmm. and death. Um, and who's singing with, with Lacey uh, a bunch on the track. Um, it, he, he came up with this, like, oh, check this guy's out, and or check this out, and he had this cool little, um, like, heavy little programmy version. They did a Garage Band Logic, whatever he was in, uh, of kind of the pre-chorus, that da 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 that kind of cool thing, and it didn't have like the Mumbotan kind of Radiotron thing happening that the DJ Snake version had, and it was like, oh, that's actually kind of cool, and it's in a key vocally that we're very familiar with. It's in that range of that. I, G, that might even be in G sharp. Um, well, that the fourth chord is a G sharp, but uh, which we're tuned to. And so, if that's a, a diatonic note for the music theory people, we're like, I can make that work, you know. So it maybe it lended itself that way. But then um, Lacey had worked with Breaking Ben on the acoustic album we did. We shot a video with her, and then we had talked with even prior to that. Uh, Brian had talked to her about doing some some stuff. So it was. Um, it was really cool for all that, those things to align. And then we brought it to her about like, what do you think about doing this cover with this? And as you said, she was super excited about it. She was a fan of the song and uh, it was a lot of fun. You know, we, we wanted it to be something different and something special. And uh, a lot of bands, I think when you're doing covers, there's this, uh, you, you straddle this line of being faithful to the original and then kind of making it your own at the same time. Uh, but out of the gate, um, we wanted to have like an impact where you heard the song and it was like, oh, okay, this is kind of cool. And then it goes to the place like, oh, wait, is this what I think it is? And then it turns into it is. Uh, and I think that was the kind of goal, the journey we wanted it to, 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 to go on to take us there as like listeners and as fans of the song. And um, so was a, that, that song was a lot of fun to make. So... <laughs> Obviously, with it being more of an electronic-based song in its natural state, were there other iterations? I mean, it sounds like not. It sounds like, you know, it basically started with the idea from JR basically bringing a partially done idea of doing the song Mm -hmm. to you. Were there other demo versions where you were kind of working your way through the arrangement of how it should go? Like, or Mm -hmm. was it... Good. Absolutely. We we had had written a couple riffs for it, uh, a couple different variations of the bridge which ultimately ended up we we ended up splicing a lot of the vocals from these different takes and things together making this little chaotic piece yeah. um but uh we we did love once we started going what really stuck was the pre-chorus and this wide open soaring um uh, uh chorus you know that mm-hmm. this kind of halftime feel which the original did not have and it, it was a very cool thing um and the uh, same way I, I love a lot of pop and a lot of hip hop and things like that. Um, a lot of accessible music on, on, on that front. I think there's connections and I can pull things with that being a fan of heavy music, you know, enjoy it just saying, even like uh, some of the new country stuff that's out. But uh, that everything, like I said, everything kind of fall, fell into place with that one. So that when the, the song really started to kind of uh, take shape and we, we, we think we figured out uh, a form that worked for us, cutting some things, extending some things, uh, keeping it so it wasn't a really long song. Um, it came about pretty organically and, and felt really comfortable and, and right once we once we landed on it. So out of curiosity, like I know obviously when 
you put out a cover on a record that you're indirectly selling, um, obviously there has to be clearances and so forth. Do you know mm-hmm. if uh, DJ Snake actually has heard your track and has offered any feedback in any way, shape, or form, or was it just kind of cleared through his people and they're like, "Yeah, we're good." And, like payment went through, <laughs> basically. Yeah, I mean, we try to do our creative thing and let the the powers that be, management and, and publishing and things like that, uh, make sure that all the clearances, obviously, and everything are good. I, I haven't heard anything personally about it. I mean, I'd love to get a take on it, um, you know, because we wanted to do the song justice, obviously. We think it's a good song. Uh, it's just catchy. It's a feel-good song. And that was another reason for us to kind of approach it was it was, it was so major sounding. It was so uplifting. Like, how do you not walk away with this sounding like, uh, you know, just a, how do we turn this into an aggressive, uh, more minor sounding, uh, you know, palette that we would be more familiar with? Well, I think on top of that, I think even lyrically, it kind of fits the overall kind of narrative of the record too. Oh, yeah. Like where it's like, mm-hmm. I mean, the, with what you did to it, it kind of now becomes sort of a melancholy type vibe mm-hmm. to it. Uh, whereas before it was sort of, almost say like kind of like a longing like a yep you know kind of it's it's kind of weird when you start breaking down songs due to difference in tempo and and sonics and so forth where you're like well now instead of it feeling like a, an optimistic and hopeful thing now you're kind of uh-huh. like oh it's kind of uh well i don't know i hope this is what you know i want this to yeah. happen i'm trying to manifest yeah. these good things but i'm just kind of not in a really good spot right now like it's mm-hmm. it's interesting how a message can change just based on simply oh, yeah. changing the arrangement or whatever of it so it was kind of interesting how you did that, are, that song. yeah I, I think the used are kings of that i, I think oh, yeah. death tones are great at that i mean you look at some of his lyrics like this is just a, this is a cheesy love song but it is rad as hell you know well i mean uh, they're the kings too of cover songs too like i mean yeah. that was actually something i was going to ask is was there anything else in contention for a cover song for this just in general maybe that you had been jamming on but then landed on this one we had uh so the last album we did uh whip it by devo mm-hmm. um and brian and i both in particular um we really like the new wave stuff you know coming out of that era and a lot of the programming and obviously the joy division and the things that those uh as that started shaping music in, in that realm and then working into nine inch nails and things um so even though we're not as electronic is that electronic based we do have a lot of uh, you know back to peter gabriel and stuff like that a lot of influence there <laughs> yeah um so i i think that was the kind of the cool elements with it it being more electronic and it is such a song on such an electronic format that's so many people are listening to you know i'll, I'll go out to bars and stuff here in nashville and you know i'm a little older but uh you know, some of the kids, especially mid twenties, early twenties. I mean, like electronic music is everything. Like the, these massive festivals and things, and, and the, the this following and this attraction to it, it, like they'll completely overlook the song sometimes because of the energy they're getting from the track that they're listening to. And I think that's kind of cool. I, I I think there's something cool about it. Whether I get their sp- same response or not, that might be a different conversation. But I get it. I know exactly what they're doing, and so to be able to take. A, a song with that electronic of a background but that at the core of it is a good song um, right you know most of the stuff i work on and, and something i learned from from ben burnley was just if i can't sit down and play that song with an acoustic with no riffs no parts or nothing you know um but if i have a, a drop c guitar and i'm riffing on an open string to me that's c minor if i can't strum a c minor and i get to my verse and and sing it and play the chorus then i probably don't have a song um, right and so to be able to take that skeleton from something and then add all the bells and whistles of what we would do, riffs and dissonance and bends and that kind of stuff. That I, I love that kind of thing. It's funny. One of my favorite YouTube videos that my wife and I, and we subsequently always inevitably get drunk and share with other people, is that uh, Dave Grohl writing the hits. Yep. Oh, my God. Got to treat gotta treat it like a bumper sticker. Life's a bitch. Keep on trucking. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, you know, and then like the thing that was always the big takeaway from that, where if you, no one has ever seen that video, they're always like, holy shit, that's so right. Is he's like, you know who writes the fucking hits? Aerosmith. And you know how they do it? Chorus. Don't bore us. Get to the chorus. Love in an elevator. How's the song start? Love in an elevator. Boom. Right yep. away. You know, like, and then you're just like, oh, yeah. Jesus Christ, they really do just start every fucking song with the chorus. Like, ragdoll, yeah. ragdoll. And you're like, fuck. <laughs> mm-hmm. and it was like oh, one of those amazing. like one of those things like it was so so stupidly simple but then as you think about it you're like oh my god like some of the like all my like 
classic rock songs kind of do do that. Like, that's fucking mm-hmm. wild. But like, it was kind of funny because like last night, uh, I was watching. I watched that Sean Mendez documentary that's on Netflix, hoping that it would be a little bit more than it was. I haven't um, checked it out yet. I was going to. But... It's very surface level, and honestly, the last I'd say thirty ish minutes and sort of how the documentary starts uh, is sort of mm-hmm. how it ends. But I wanted to see more of that. Um, where basically there's, there, you know, I'm having vocal problems and I ha- I'm in yep. uh, Brazil and I have to cancel this tour and, or this this date and things like that. Like I wanted to kind of see more of that and get more because it showed more of him as a as as a person. Yeah. Instead of just like, oh, here's me playing in this arena and it's fun and mm-hmm. you know, it, it's kind of very, it's like. It's like fluff. It's like 90% yeah. fluff and like 10% cool shit that I wish they would have expanded upon uh-huh. more. Um, like there's a scene where he's literally going to pick up his sister and some dude's like next to him, like snapping a photo while they're at a light. And he's like, oh, my daughter's a big fan. Can you say hi? And da, da, da. And when they, they started going, I really expected him to be like, God, it's, it's really hard to be on all the time for people. Like I expected mm-hmm. that to be where it starts going. Yeah, it, it wasn't. It was just all of a sudden him picking up his, his sister yeah. and talking about whatever. And you're like, all right i mean yeah. I guess maybe that's that's, maybe that's that's what i would expect too that's what i because I, I think he's far enough into his career he's starting to get taken a little bit more seriously outside of yeah uh, some of the typical demographic you know he just did that song with bieber that's a huge thing i mean bieber's there yeah you know, so uh, it, it was a thing where i i wanted a little bit more um and then subsequently right after i got done with that i watched the justin timberlake and the tennessee kids uh concert mm-hmm. and you know, it was so weird because, like, I kind of at times when I was watching the Sean Mendes thing, I was like, I see pieces of sort of like how you could be Justin, like where it's like you got this band and you play and you there's a lot of interplay with them, but you're just not there yet. Like you're yep. you're either too young as an artist or too young as a person to kind of really figure out how to work that and work the show around it. Whereas like Justin obviously is just on a whole nother level and it's like yeah. at one point you know they're on a stage the stage is coming out into the arena like out to where uh front of house is and you know there's an acoustic and then he pulls out this acoustic and the band the band and him kind of cut into this cover of uh one of my favorite songs human nature by michael jackson mm-hmm. fucking phenomenal cover then he starts kind of finger picking this song and i'm like oh shit he's getting ready to play what goes around comes around i mean i recognize the melody and then, like I said, I was like, oh, man, this is like one of my favorite Justin songs. But like, it's really cool to hear this version of it. Mm-hmm. And my wife's like, how did you know what's what it is? It's like the melody's still there. Like, just yeah, because it's absolutely. not like just because you're not hearing it on key, like the like he's finger picking it. It's still the same notes. Mm-hmm. It's still the same melody. But like now, instead of it being kind of a mid tempo, y slow burn kind of song. Now it's like a really slow, sexy, yep. chill, acoustic kind of thing. And to me, like as a fan of music. I love seeing shit like that. Like it always makes yeah. me laugh. Like when, when you go see bands and you guys maybe will change a song. Like, we'll just say like, um, we'll say diary of Jane, for example. Mm-hmm. So maybe that song starts off. It's like, gun, gun, like, and it's like, got that. So like, dun, 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 like, and you guys might tease that out a lot longer. Like maybe it's the drum kind of holding that beat for a second. Yeah. And then maybe the bass will kind of come in and start it. And then you'll hear the, the, you know, the delayed guitar part, but you're not playing the whole thing. You're just playing like the first couple of notes. Sure. And it's like, it seemingly takes people until you hear the, f- the way the song actually normally starts where everyone's like oh oh i know this and you're like how the fuck did you not know this <laughs> yeah that is a thing I'm, and uh I, from our perspective it's like the musician side of things of being creative you know you want to have the liberty to kind of push and pull um what you're doing and keep things interesting and, and if somebody comes and sees you they're not you're not regurgitating the same material over and over again well it's building it's a show same. too an actual show yeah. from start to finish Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and at the same time, you're, it, it's no different than writing. Um, you know, trying to recreate the wheel, if, if you're writing, is a pretty uphill battle. Uh, I, I always feel like it, you're trying to write something that everybody can relate to and has heard a million times but never heard before. Like mm-hmm. you want them to walk away with this familiarity. And the only difference is it's like, wow, I wouldn't have said it like that, but I know exactly what you mean. You know, right. we're all touching on the same continuum here. We're all we're all going in, in the same linear progression as just a society and, and a, a generation as we are, whatever. Um, but, you know, you can go back to any period in history, even back to classical, you can find moments of identifying with emotion. Even before, you know, classical music, like, uh, was a huge influence for me. And you had everything, Mozart, Beethoven, a lot of 
major keys and this and that. And then Paganini and Rachmaninoff were these Russian composers that came in and started doing minor keys. And they were accusing them of being like devil worshippers and witches, witchcraft and things because they were doing these dark minor dissonant keys. And it was obviously communicating something there. You know, there was no words. There was no language involved. There was no instrumentation difference. There was no tempo changes. It was just the note choices that they used. And so I think that that does continue throughout music history. And that's where we're there. So we want to keep plugged into that. And um, again, with this new album, uh, I, I think that was something we wanted to strive to do is to talk, communicate differently, but do the same thing we would do with Breaking Pan and with Corn, uh, but just do it in, in, in a different language. Um, but have this, those that fan base, the rock fan base that we, we try to appeal to so much, be able to go, oh, that's cool. I haven't heard it that way, but I totally get what this sounds familiar. I know what it is. You know, there, there's it's comfortable for people to listen to. Kind of as we're, we're wrapping up, um, you know, you obviously announced the live stream you guys are going to be doing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we kind of touched on earlier everyone will be vying for the same touring space basically Mm -hmm. uh when when touring is allowed to happen what does what is the goal for this band because obviously you know as we kind of were saying before uh breaking ben basically is kind of in the the beginning i would assume or you already are in Mm -hmm. the stages of pre-pro for the new record corn in theory probably in the same boat so that's what you know love and death that's where this would come into play anyway but with everyone now, like I said, that even playing field of everyone having the same time off because they can't tour, does does that potentially affect this release because maybe now the writing process for the other two bands gets going a little bit faster and doesn't give you the time that you wanted to support this record uh, as much as you maybe wanted to? Sure, I think it, well, I think it's the easy answer is it's just different. Um, so I, I think uh, uh, we can stand apart in some areas just because of the platform that the band's being built on. And similar thing is I'm not comparing us, but uh, it, it, like an audio slave, like they, they had a platform, you know what I mean? When they, when they started, they, they were, they, they had a foundation. Um, mm-hmm. So for us, I think we're, we're relying on that some just so, to have the opportunity to get in front of people when we can't tour um, as far as accessibility. But then as far as goals going forward, it, it's something that, uh, we haven't had a huge finger on the pulse yet or, or a, uh, a solid plan with that because everything's still so up in the air. I mean, even with corner breaking Ben, we, I mean, we're hoping to go back out next year or uh, like with us with live nation. And we've put reserve those same venues for the same dates next year, but I, you know, we hope we can get there and you know, hopefully it's vaccine or whatever the situation is. I mean, it's not a talk, a comment on politics or anything. It's just us getting back to normal life. And for us, um, when you're bringing 15,000 people into a venue together, it's a little different than opening up a gym or a, 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 a whatever. I mean, you're talking, there's insurance, there's hundreds of people being hired for that day. There's a lot of things that go into play, a lot of money on the line that have to, that has to make sense. And ju- just from a sheer insurance standpoint. Right. Um, it, so it can be tough. Uh, so that's hard to forecast too much as far as touring, um, what, what things are going to go out because I, I, there's a lot of people talking about driving shows and a lot of things it, like a lot of comedians are doing it. Um, but they're not carrying $120,000 a day with the production either, you know, nope. and they've got, they've got one guy, not, uh, five band guys and 40 crew guys, which, you know, we typically have on those tours. So it, it, that, that make that presents its own challenges. And so how that fits in with, uh, love and, death is I, I think we're we're really excited about continuing having the opportunity to push this further than we probably could have otherwise sometimes in a full-time touring year and and, and uh, as you know brian and i and breaking ben and corn have done two uh tours together and even with the schedule on those tours it's difficult to get together and write you know our buses are parked next to each other for a month and a half or whatever the tour is and it's just difficult to find that time or the motivation or whatever it is and so we, we just look forward to really pressing hard with this and kind of showcasing uh, what we're proud of, what we've been able to accomplish with this, um, and how that plugs into whether it be uh, touring. We'd love to tour, um, but it has to, you know, it's going to have to make sense uh, with our uh, with the other bands and tour schedule and things like that. So um, we'll see. We're, we've got uh, a pretty solid strategy, I think, in place for releasing 
hopefully a couple of singles, you know, hopefully they, they do well, but we have, we forecasted out quite a bit. Um, you have mentioned the live stream thing coming up. Uh, we have some other things in the pipeline for the love and death project that we haven't announced yet. Um, uh, and if, if it keeps going, we'll, we'll probably do another album here sooner than later. Um, you know, ne next two years or something rather than seven, <laughs> but, um, uh, <laughs> You know, to kind of keep it going. I think it's re renewed uh, some some energy and, and uh, excitement we have about it because it's it's so fresh and new and, and um, rejuvenating for us because it's it's just not our normal thing. That's what kind of keeps it exciting for us. So we're going to be plugging ahead. We're going to be like I said, doing radio. We're going to do as much press as we can. We're going to do live streams, maybe post a couple of them, um, and then hopefully. Would love to do some shows down the road when everything starts going back up. <laughs> Lastly, where can everyone find you and or any of the bands you want to plug online? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, my socials are all under just my name, J A S E N R A U C H, Jason Round, and uh, Breaking Benjamin, obviously, uh, Corn, and uh, Brian Welch. You can find him there. But uh, yeah, I, we try to stay as connected as we can. Uh, we try to between messages and stuff that come in sometimes can get a little crazy but we try to be pretty responsive if we can and uh that's how we keep a pulse on things that's how we we stay connected so we appreciate everybody's voices out there and everybody's comments everybody's um it's much more than than likes and much more than acceptance it is for us keeping a finger on the pulse and, and being educated as to what's out there what people um you know, you, you don't want to get in an echo chamber where people are just telling you what you want to hear all the time. So keeping um, your ear out and, and, and your, your feelers out for other things out there, other opinions and fans, and but, uh, that's what we kind of thrive on. So uh, we're there, and hopefully we're accessible enough. Absolutely. Well, thank you for taking the time, and enjoy the rest of your Thank you, man. Likewise. Oh, that fucking sucked. Oh, that fucking sucked. Shao Kahn, what'd you think? That was pathetic. Yeah. Yeah. Coach, what'd you think? Okay. Okay. I mean, I knew it was gonna fucking suck, but I think those guys were a little rude. Austin Powers? How about new? Okay, I thought we were gonna get the Austin Powers vote. We did not. John, use that for your podcast. It fucking sucks. But uh, you knew what you were getting into. It's your own fault. Uh, it will result in less listens. You're going to see a <coughs> decline in listeners if you start the show with that. You're going to see 30 seconds in, the number will plummet. And I will be there at the bottom of the plummet saying, I fucking told you, don't use this fucking riff. It sucks. <laughs> But it's yours. <laughs>